Today's Noob Spiro podcast is proudly brought to you in partnership with Adreno Spearfishing Supplies. Go to spearfishing.com.au to take advantage of $15 Australia-wide flat shipping, or better yet, drop into their Brisbane or all-new Sydney store and talk to their experienced and helpful staff. Head on over to spearfishing.com.au. It's the place to go for all your spearfishing equipment needs. Hello and welcome to the Noob Spiro podcast, where we interview experts, authorities, and characters on all things spearfishing. Come and join us after the show at noobspiro.com, the online spearfishing community helping you to become a better Spiro. Here are your hosts for the show, Shrek and Turbo. G'day, Noob Spiro community. You're back today with Shrek and Turbo, semi-famous podcasters. <laughs> today joining us from the sunny state of Queensland is the second doctor we've had on the show. This time it's a doctor in zoology. He's a friend, of, uh, a friend of the show, Steve the Grub Drumstick, put us on to him. The boys call him the Macro Whisperer. Richard Pillins, welcome to the show. How are you? Yeah, good on you, boys. Thanks, thanks for that intro. <laughs> we took. It's a lot to live up to, mate. But you'll be right. Yeah, I'm not sure where that praise comes from. I don't think Steve spent that much time with me yet, but um, oh, must mate. have done something right. He's in love. It is <laughs> ridiculous. He's got a man crush. <laughs> so, so Richard, um, just tell us a bit about how you got started spearfishing and um, and what that was like, mate. Um, so I was actually born and born and, and brought up in South Africa. Um, don't hold that against me. Um, <laughs> but uh, and yeah, there's a book that came out there. I think it came out in 1987 by a guy called Pitt von Royen, who, uh, who was a really good Spiro, and it was um, sort of the news agency one day, and had a picture of a guy coming off the bottom with a, with a Spanish mackerel, and we lived in Cape Town, I'd never really spe- seen Spanish before, and um, I guess that started my obsession with spearfishing, and not only spearfishing, but Spanish mackerel, I suppose, and uh, so yeah, I didn't really get into it, I had the book, probably I've still got the book, um, it's a bit tattered now compared to what it used to be, but um, it was kind of the South African spearfishing bible, I suppose. You know, it had had a lot of the old famous guys like Tommy Border in it, and some of the you know some of the kind of legends of the sport in that country. Cool. And uh, yeah, it sort of sort of went from there and uh, moved to Australia. And when was it? Probably uh, 90, 95, I think. And uh, actually, ran into it's Tony Hugh on the beach down at Kingscliff one day, and. Uh, he was walking out the water with a, with a big long-tailed tuna on his back, been out for a shore dive, and uh, <laughs> went had a pretty nice. Went had a chat, and uh, yeah, he, at that stage he was the the Rob Allen kind of dealer in in Brisbane, and um, yeah, he took me out, and uh, yeah, sort of been hooked ever since. So um, kind of grind from there, I suppose. So he he took you out on your first shore dive or a boat dive? No, he took me out on a boat dive off, off Morton, yeah, Cape Morton in, uh, would have been sort of April, I guess. Um, so the water was nice and warm, crystal clear. Um, didn't I don't think I saw a Spanish that day, saw plenty of plenty of crays. Actually, that day the crayfish were walking along the bottom, there was that many of them. So it must have been sort of during some sort of mating, some of the, the spawning sort of migration, because there were literally just lines of crays just walking over the sand. It was just a matter of diving down and picking them up. So. Um, Never seen that again, but, um, but yeah, pretty much from then, yeah, bought a, bought a gun off him and um, dive with him a little bit, don't dive with him that much anymore these days, but um, yeah, sort of there and started the, the love affair. Oh, cool. Uh, Turbo and I have both met Tony. We did a uh, radio and first aid operators course with him last year. He, he's um, he's still up there on the Sunshine Coast making his edge guns, I believe, um, but yeah, he's a nice guy, so that's, that's pretty interesting. So you've always had a passion for the marine environment, obviously. Uh, we, I talked a bit about the start about how you had a doctorate in zoology, and uh, I believe you're right into marine ecology. Is that right? Yeah, I am. Um, so I'm lucky. My job sort of takes me all around the great country of ours, and um, work on a range of things from yeah endangered sort of sawfish and spearhead sharks through to lobster fisheries in Torres Strait, uh, whale sharks in Ningaloo. Looking at a lot of yeah, do a lot of work on I guess how fish move and how they utilise the habitat. Um, with, yeah, satellite and acoustic tags. Um, do a lot of work on yeah turtles, turtle movement. So what what are you working on right now? What does a sort of an average work day look like for Richard Pillins? <laughs> <laughs> um, probably shouldn't say I go diving most of the time. No, um, <laughs> that's fine, mate. We're all jealous. Yeah, look, um, yeah, a lot, a lot of our work's project based, so it's sort of you know it's a matter of spending maybe two weeks at, at Ningaloo um, doing the work that we do over there, which which might involve doing you know scuba transects just on the on the reef looking at diversity of coral and fish and just counting fish um, 
just looking at the sort of yeah, just I guess the, the composition of fish along the Ningaloo and, and Pilbara coast, um, and looking at you know how effective some of the sanctuary zones are, the marine parks they've got over there. Um, looking at the different habitat types and how fish associate with those different habitat types and for, you know, for, for future marine park planning, as well as yeah, some detailed sort of fish movement studies where we tag you know 50 to 80 individuals from one species, be it Spangled Emperor or Trevally or or drummer or parrotfish um, and look at how they use habitat and how big an area they need um, to I guess to you know to, to carry out their daily activities in and in terms of yeah how big sanctuaries need to be and yeah mate, so a lot of the work we do is to do with you know I guess management for, of species um, not just sometimes with fisheries but just in terms of how you know how how humans interact with them and and how, how best to manage those those species and, and, and conserve them into the future. That sounds pretty interesting. It sounds fairly diverse too. Your work, like you, you've got a bit of variety in it, would it, which would keep it interesting. Do you ever get frustrated when you're out there doing some of these, maybe these scuba dives, surveying and stuff, and you see like big schools of mackerel or something swim past? Oh, you do. Um, your mates don't really sympathise with, with you when you complain <laughs> to them about it though. Um, but um, yeah, look, you know, you. You do, but uh, yeah, just fortunate enough to, to have a job that you know takes you to some of the best parts of the country. So um, pays not to get too frustrated. Oh, and, mate, uh, I was up there at, um, at Point Sampson two years ago, and I was standing on the rocks looking out, and this whole bay there at Point Sampson in the north was just alive with mackerel. Like it was ridiculous. The whole thing was chopping up, and I looked down at my feet, and there was probably a meter and a half mackerel swimming around in a meter of water, just yeah. just straight off the rocks, and it was ridiculous. And I stood there, and I was I could not believe it. And then what time was a big black spot tusky, probably about oh seven kilos, straight after it. I could not believe it. Is it that good over there? Mate, it, it is that good over there. Um, certainly, it's the mackerel capital of Australia, the whole Ningaloo coastline. Um, and I guess you know the reason for that is that it's it's highly unpopulated. So you know there's not that many people that certainly it's not you know there's no major cities there. There's still a lot of people that fish there. Um, and the bag limits over there are, you know, probably a lot more conservative than, than what they are here. So, you know, you're only allowed to say one coral trout a day, um, which means that you can pretty much go out whenever you want and get a coral trout. Um, you're not allowed to shoot coral trout at Ningaloo. They've got, you know, really, you really sort of restrictive restrictions there on on spear fishing. Um, and you can, you know, you can see the difference that makes in that there's lots of coral trout and lots of big tuskies around because um, those are the sorts of fish that. You know, we, we have a bigger impact on than line fishermen, I suppose. Um, but yeah, look, it's um, there's a there's a lot of mackerel there. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, cool. Right. So you talked a little bit about getting started. Tony Hugh was kind enough to take you out on a couple of dives. What were some of the early first obstacles you had starting out? Well, I guess when I first started diving in Brisbane, you know, there wasn't when I first started diving in general. There was certainly, you know, there was no internet. There was pretty much if you wanted to learn about diving, it was pretty much just books. So the Terry Mars book was a you know, the, the Blue Water Hunters book was a was a big influence. And it was pretty much just talking to people, you know, the the international free diving and spearfishing news was still coming out every I guess every every four months or whatever it was, three yeah. months. Yeah. Um, so I mean yeah, I, I don't think there were you know, the, I was I guess I was fortunate that I I kind of had a, had a group of guys in Brisbane that, you know, used to pretty much dive every weekend. And so, you know, there, there wasn't that many people around so you pretty much always had a spot on the boat you know yeah I don't think there was there was obstacles you know there was only really <clears throat> the only guns that you could really buy there was no spear fishing shop so you pretty much you could get Rob Allen gear which in my opinion is still the, you know still the best the best gear around it's simple it lasts forever I've still got the same you know 1.3 aluminium Rob Allen that I bought back then um, and it still shoots as good as it ever did so um, you know all you do is change the rubbers and the spears every now and again and um, so it's just simple tough gear that you know just just lasts the, the test of time they are um, ro they are definitely a robust gun especially with those those early mechs um is that the yeah yeah the first model yeah that was that's the original model so I've, yeah i've still got still got a couple of them lying around but um but yeah so look yeah i don't think that you know there weren't i don't think there were any obstacles really it was just a just a really easy kind of laid back sport and, and uh, you know certainly it's changed a lot um, I guess the biggest change was adrenaline spearfishing store I suppose and that sort of you know made spearfishing popular again I suppose um, I guess being a bit selfish it, you know back then you pretty much had to join to yourself you know whether it was Flat Rock or Flinders or wherever you went you were always the only spearfishing boat there and um, you, know, you, you never had any any other spearos around um, but, um, and what about um, in that time, have you noticed any sort of decline in fish species around Flinders and Flat Rock and those 
places you went in your early days? Um, well, you're not allowed to dive at Flat anymore, unfortunately. But um, but yeah, I mean, look, certainly, you know, when I first started diving off Morton, I, I couldn't dive, you know, more than probably 10 metres. I was diving with guys like Simon Baldwin, who, who's you know, one of the legends of Brisbane spearfishing. And he was diving 20, 25 metres back then, and he still is now. Um, and, you know, pretty much every trip off Morton, Simon would shoot a, say, 6 to 10 kilo tusky or bigger. Um, and you know that was at places like Flinders where you just don't see tuskies anymore. And there was just there was just a lot more bigger fish of those you know those slow growing kind of bottom fish in that you know 15 to, to 25 meter mark. Um, and there's you know there's no doubt there's been a significant drop in those big tuskies. You still get big tuskies in Brisbane. Don't get me wrong, but you've kind of got to dive you know 25 meters plus, um, or just get lucky and kind of you know get one. In, in a place where everyone's kind of come out of deep water and so we've done a fair bit of work, work in Morton Bay with, with deep water cameras and you know if you stick a camera in 35 metres of water you see 10 to 15 kilo tuskies but um, wow. you don't see them you don't see them in shallow water and um, you know that's not that's not because people you know that's because spear fishermen are shooting them it's not because you know, there's only a few line fishermen in Morton Bay that, that actively target them mm, okay um, but um, but no, look. Apart from you know, apart from tuskies, um, you know, I don't shoot cod or kingies or, or GTs or anything like that. And you know, the thing that I guess people realize need to realize with mackerel is that probably five years ago we had a really couple of years of really bad mackerel season. So you'd go out and you might see, if you're lucky, you'd see you know one or two Spanish in a day in summer. Um, whereas the last three or four years, you know, you pretty much. If you wanted to bag out every time you went out, you could just as there's, there's, there's been that many mackerel the last few years that, um, and that's just a that's just basically a recruitment cycle. It's you know it's got very little to do with with how the fishery is managed or how much is being caught. Basically, it means that if you get really good conditions for the for the larvae after they spawned and you know a lot more of them survive, then for the next you know the mackerel that we shoot in Brisbane are between probably two and four years old, majority of them, so they're not very old. Um, yeah. So if you get you know if you get those good conditions sort of two to four years ago, then you're going to get huge schools to ten kilo mackerel. How do the major flood events on the coast affect those cycles? Yeah, I mean, so yeah, there's there's no I guess there's no clear link with mackerel. There's a clear link between things like barramundi and, and prawns. We know that those big flood events are, are good for them, um, and you know there's there's probably a link with 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 mackerel as well. So more nutrients in the system, more food. It's just yeah, we don't we don't really know too much about those kind of really really tiny mackerel in terms of where they are mm. and what they feed on. Um, you know, the, you, you, you might see a school of maybe one kilo Spanish that are maybe 40 centimetres long, but you just just generally don't see them much smaller than that. Well, obviously we've been talking a fair bit about mackerel, and perhaps that might be the first memorable fish you shot. What can you tell us the story of your first memorable fish? Um, what was the what was the conditions like and um, and what was so memorable about it? Probably the first memorable fish I shot. I think I shot a wahoo before I shot a mackerel. And uh, yeah, so out with a with a mate, Greg Thomas, who's also another old Brisbane diver that's still still going strong. Um, I don't know if you've met Tomo or not, but um, out of his boat, this is probably I guess late nineties, I suppose, and pulled up to Flat Rock. It was a cloudy, overcast, glassy day, and um, being mad keen as I was, I was always the first one in my wetsuit, always the first one ready to go. And yeah. uh, some will say I'm still like that, but um, <laughs> I don't think I'm—I don't think I'm quite as rabid as I used to be. But um, unless unless there's mackerel around, yeah. And uh, yeah, I looked over the side, and there was a there was literally like a I don't know a school of 150 wahoo just oh. under the boat, a meter under the surface, and um, yeah. I just kind of looked at them and I, said, pro I probably would have just gone, look guys, I'll go boaty. <laughs> I'll go just jump in like you know. <laughs> right, eh? uh, I think there's a few 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 expletives and uh, yeah, pretty much just rolled, grabbed my gun, rolled over the boat and um, just yeah, I don't remember loading it and just unloaded it into the into the closest wahoo and they weren't they weren't big, they were probably only like ten kilos or something, but um hit it hit it a bit sort of well not too low just under the spine but strung it because i was that close to it and um yeah it sort of ro raced off and just about split itself in half but yeah managed to as i got my hand on the tail the spear pretty much fell out but yeah i landed it and uh that was as it turns out that was the last year i ever that was the last fish i shot with that it was a 1.2 rail gun rob allen rail gun the next fish i shot was about a 30 kilo wahoo about 10 minutes later and um couple of big bull sharks that Flat Rock's famous for ate the wahoo and the gun and, and tried to eat <laughs> try to eat me. So um, oh, yeah, it was no. a pretty special day and uh, they grabbed someone else's gun and proceeded to shoot another big wahoo and it, it got eaten as well and bent the spear and 
So it was a bit of a bit of a dramatic day, really, and uh, I was a yeah, poor student back then, so I had to buy a new gun and replace someone else's spear. It was a, uh, oh, no. But yeah, look, that was probably the most, up until that point, that's probably the most exciting day of my life. And, um, you know, a lot of people, sharks are just one of the, you know, part of diving that, you know, you, you got you to gotta put up with. And, you know, you know, back in those days, people, well, people still carry power heads, but, you know, my view of it is, is, if you if you carry a powerhead, you're really you're really carrying it for the wrong reason. You know, if you're going to get eaten by a shark, it's going to be a shark that you know you have no control over. You're not going to have time to put a powerhead on. And and carrying a powerhead is just to be it's just not right. You know, we're we're, we're there in their environment. Um, we've got a gun. If you know if things turn bad and, and you've got to shoot a shark, and you know be prepared to sacrifice a spear or a gun to it mm. rather than. You know, rather than blowing things away, but um, you know, that's, that's a good call. So, when you're out nowadays, what sort of things do you do to manage sharks? And um, oh, we dive off Morton regularly as well, but some of our listeners probably aren't exposed to regular um, shark activity. We, we seem to cop quite a few bronzies and, and bulls off Morton. What, what kind of things do you and your crew do to minimize sharks and shark activity? Yeah, I mean, you know, certainly, you know, bronzies or. No, they're, yeah, they they're not a they're not a true bronze whaler, but um, oh okay, that that's what everyone calls them. Though yeah, they're sort of a sort of a subtropical tropical species that they're that coppery colour. Oh okay, um, and um, you know I've, I've, I've probably lost like one or two mackerel to them in the last ten years. So they generally you know those guys are generally pretty well behaved. They might race around a bit and you know get a bit horny, but they generally um, <laughs> they, they, they you know they, they certainly would ne- you know would never go you. And they, you know, very rarely they'll eat your fish. I guess the bullies are the, the ones that, you know, are the, the ones to worry about. And, um, you know, if the bullies if the bullies are on and are super, super aggressive, then, you know, really the only thing you can do is just to leave. Um, it's just not worth it. You know, I've had probably two close shades of big bullies in, you know, the last probably 15 years. Um, and most of those have been just because you've you've stayed too long and sort of pushed your limits. And you can you know as soon as you turn up, you can you can tell what sort of mood they're in if they you know if they if they're charging up onto you. You know if you haven't even shot a fish and they're charging you on the surface and their pectoral fins are, are down, their backs are arched, then it's just not worth it. You know, um, and they're not like that every day. You know we've shot there's days when you can shoot mackerel in front of them and they don't they don't even budge. Um, so it's yeah you know it's just I guess it's just a matter of. Being, being smart about it, you know. Obviously, if you're gonna if you're gonna burly up, it's gonna it's gonna stir the sharks up. Um, so you know we don't we don't burly, and you know I don't you know burling probably yeah it makes a difference. It, it'll certainly probably get you more mackerel, but um, it'll probably mean that you lose more and you got you know more risk of, of firing the sharks up. So um, yeah, okay, cool. But yeah, you know sharks are you know sharks are just part of the part of the deal. If you want to spearfish, you're gonna you're gonna see sharks. We're lucky enough that we live in a country where we still got you know healthy shark populations and that's true yeah. you know, that's pretty much it if you've got healthy shark populations and you've got a healthy ecosystem and you know you're, you're kind of lucky to be to be spearing there um yeah. and uh you know occasionally you're going to lose the odd fish to a shark but um you know if that makes you be a bit better shot or, or get a bit closer and put a headshot in instead of shooting them up the ass well that's not a bad thing either you know that's yeah. kind of helps you helps you develop your skill and, and how you approach fish and you know being able to relax in the water with sharks is just a big part of Big part of you know getting experience and 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 being a, being a better diver. But mm. there's days where you know if you know if I'm diving off Fraser and I jump in and there's four big bullies, I won't I won't stay. I'll just I'll find somewhere else because it's you know at the end of the day it's it's not worth it. I think that was well said, um, Richard. It's funny how Spiros. Some days you see on social media, Spiros look really bad, and then the other day I was really proud to be a Spiro. There was a lot of guys um, that were really quite angry seeing a big tiger shark um, pulled up and, and killed and um, I think it's funny Spiros have an amazing um, respect for apex predators it's I, I don't know if it's part of our sport or it's the way we sort of learn how to spearfish or whatever it is but I was pretty I was, I was, I was pretty um, stuck with that so no I think and a lot of people aren't aware of, of the um, value apex predators have on the on no and you know you're right we do like you know there's there's, there's no other sport out there that you know that spends that much time in the water with the sharks and you know gets to see them i guess that's the difference you know there's there's professional surfers that spend you know far more time in the water than we do but you know they don't see sharks because they're always above the water and their heads are you know they're not looking so um we see more sharks than just about any other you know 
sport, sport, sport out there, no doubt. So yeah, cool. All right, Richard, uh, it's time for Pirate Pete to get involved. Pirate um, Pete, where are you? Take it away, Pete. <laughs> It's time to open the Veterans Vault! Thanks, Barnica Bob. Today's Veterans Vault is brought to you by Adreno Spearfishing Supplies. They've got everything you need to get started in spearfishing and freediving. Yeah, when I was getting started four years ago, I remember the frank and honest advice that Sam Cox gave me about everything from what spear gun to buy to how to meet and contact experienced locals like Turbo Brown. Thanks, buddy. You can visit them at their Queensland store in Brisbane or their Sydney store. Yeah, so from all of us here at the Noob Spear, a big thank you to Adreno for your support. Head on over to spearfishing.com.au for all your spearfishing equipment needs. Yeah, right. Um, well, I guess without giving away all my secrets... No, um, no, you have to give them all away. Yeah, that was part of the deal, mate. Signing contract. <laughs> I, I guess, you know, I think the important thing to realise with, with spearfishing is that, you know, not everyone... I guess I'm, you know, mackerel are by far my favourite fish to shoot. Um, I'd rather shoot mackerel over jacks or, you know, trout or whatever. That's just that's just what I love doing. And, and some people are different. Some people love chasing, you know, some people love chasing bottom fish and, and diving deep and, you know, shooting jacks and jewies or... Red Emperor or whatever, but um, you know, that's fine. But um, for me, you know, mackerel is basically what I, you know, that's why I go spearfishing and, you know, and so in, in winter in Brisbane, I, I I go north. I don't I don't really dive up here because it's, well, it's too cold for a start. But, um, <laughs> you know, the mackerel kind of start to thin out by July and you get the odd one in August. But, um, you know, from sort of August till November, December, there's not many mackerel around. Um, so I generally, yeah, I'll just generally go, go further north and, and try and find them up there. Um, but in terms of, sorry, no, you're right. that? We're, 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 I was going to ask you about, like, so Spanish mackerel are called Spanish here. What are they called in South Africa? Pretty much, they just call them cooter over there. Okay. All right. What other well, names are they known by? Just for our audience, we've got some diverse listeners. I think yeah. So in the in the states, they call them king mackerel. Um, I think they call them king mackerel in, in, in South Africa too, occasionally, but it's mainly cooter. Um, I think they call them Tangiri in, you know, in Indonesia and parts of Southeast Asia. The Fijians call them Walu. Um, yeah, you don't get them in Vanuatu, unfortunately. You get them in New Caledonia. Wow, that's unusual. You don't get them in Vanuatu. No, uh, it's just sort of, yeah, it's a, like it's a little bit, probably a little bit too, too, well, it's not too tropical. It's just, yeah, you just, you just don't seem to get them there. Um, probably just too far away from kind of some of the more coastal areas where they where they occur um so so spanish mackerel um from my understanding there's kind of like there's several sort of groups around australia and they have a range is that is that is that correct is my understanding right yeah that's right so you know i think the population in the in the nt is sort of d different to the population um you know in queensland um yeah, even though they're capable of you know moving large distances they you know they, they don't always do that on the east coast it's probably a little bit more I guess a bit more mark movements because they tend to, they, they move south with the East Australian current in you know early summer. Um, so you get them as far south as Sydney occasionally in really warm years when the East Australian current you know really pushes down. Um, and then they'll you know then they'll they'll move back up. But it's still yeah in terms of you know actual movement they're a fish that doesn't really respond well to being caught by by line fishing. So most of the fish that get tagged are probably going to die anyway. So out of the thousands that have been tagged, I think there's only ever been, you know, probably like ten recaptures or something like that. So oh, there right. isn't a lot of there isn't a lot of information on on actual you know, recaptures and, and movements of of mackerel up and down the coast. Um, so that's something that I guess yeah, there's there's probably a need to, to look at that a bit more. But yeah, there's certainly no doubt that you know they move they move south in in summer and and um, you know you'll get them you know in Coffs Harbour every year um, and then they'll. In places like Brisbane, we're lucky. We'll, you know, we'll get them for a bit longer. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, obviously further north you go, you get them all year round. But there's, you know, there's times where you, where, where there's better times than others, um, depending on where you are. And they, they seem to be obviously a sustainable um, species to hunt in, in whatever part of the world they're found. Or what, what's your experience with that? Yeah. Look. I, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. You know too much about the fisheries in, in other parts of the world um yeah. certainly you know australia's got you know big commercial fisheries in, in on the east coast and the nt and as well as wa and certainly you know the mackerel fisheries in australia are, are sustainable they're you know i guess they're, they're a species that that grows 
grows pretty quickly. Um, obviously, you know, have millions of eggs, so in, in you know in good conditions, it's 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 easy to have a sustainable population. But there are years where you know the catch is is much lower than it, than it has been in previous years, and that's not necessarily because they're overfished. It's just because of that you know natural variability and how many there are. Okay, cool. All right, let's cool. let's talk hunting techniques. So, what would you do? What sort of conditions, if you're heading out on a on a day to hunt mackerel, like tides and wind and weather conditions, sort of, what makes an ideal day to hunt mackerel? Uh, any day you can get out is an ideal day to hunt mackerel in, in my book. And, you know, I guess I don't. You know, for for me, I, I'm not. I guess it's more about the weather than the than the tides. Um, you know, in 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 southeast Queensland, around Brisbane, any time from say December through you know July. Um, you, you're pretty much, if you're in the right spot and the water's right, you're pretty much guaranteed that you're going to run into a mackerel somewhere. There's obviously places that are, you know, hold more mackerel than others, um, and that's just something I guess that you, you know, over time you you dive a bunch of places and you kind of get to know, you know, there's some places that just hold mackerel all the time, where there's other places at certain times of the day or certain times of the tide they might, you know, they might fire up a bit more, but it, a lot of it's just got to do with water clarity too you know there's days when the water's green and a bit cold um and they they're not there and yep. then there's days when it's you know beautiful blue the current's raging and there's mackerel everywhere so cool. a lot of it's got to do with you know currents not so much tides in my experience more more current um and you know the the key is just to just to move around if, if the mackerel aren't in one spot just just keep trying if you know and i guess that's what People are different. Some people might might go somewhere and they might want to anchor up and, and swim around. If you're on a reef where there's where there's no current and you can swim around all day, you're probably not going to see as many mackerel as you are in a, in a place where the current's roaring and you've okay. got to do drift dives to you know to to, to, to keep it safe. Um, and you know, for me, I'd far rather be, be drift diving all day than anchor the boat and swim around for, for two hours and you know shoot a shoot a jack or something um so i guess yeah people you know people that, that specifically want to want to target mackerel just need to to realize that you basically you know, if, there's, if there's areas with a lot of current that's not to say that you won't you won't shoot mackerel in, in areas where there isn't any current but in my experience you're better off to be you know places where there where there is that current um and it, you know it doesn't have to be deep water you can shoot mackerel off brisbane in 10 meters of water you can shoot them in 40 meters of water you know it really doesn't matter um it's just whether or not they're there or not. Now, last time I went out, Richard, I, I was frothing at the bit to get out. I hadn't been out for like six months, hadn't seen a mackerel for nine months. And uh, I, I, we, were in this, we were in this spot in about 16 metres of water. It was amateur hour. It was amateur hour. Honest. And I, I just want you to hear my awesome technique because, you know, we run a podcast on spearfishing, but sometimes we're the worst at it. So, <coughs> Oh, sometimes, often. I, I, I saw... <laughs> three mackerel all over 20 um, approaching me from one direction I've taken the fastest breath you've ever seen I've dive bombed straight at them like a I don't know how excited was I yeah pretty excited it was like watching a it was like watching a diesel um, train <laughs> dive like <it> was just <laughs> straight straight at them and uh, these mackerel I, I, I think they were pretty chilled out and um, I, I, pro, I, I definitely would have got close enough for a shot so I'm straight at them like a train and uh, they've all bolted and and I, I thought oh, I'll just wrote that one off like oh, I haven't been in the water for a while but then sort of like 10 minutes later I did it again and uh, <laughs> You know, obviously swimming straight at mackerel is, is, is often not a good idea. Like for me, I've found diving away from them slightly and um, and going with them as you duck dive. And then um, they seem to be a bit more relaxed. Is that your experience? Yeah, look, you know, I think, you know, the more, the more mackerel you shoot, it's like anything, the more mackerel you shoot, the better you get. And I think a lot of that's because of the, you know, your, your ability to, to stay calm yeah. um, and, and not panic. Um, you know, like I, I used to be like you. I used to, you know, the first first mackerel I shot was at Flinders Reef, and uh, same thing. I saw it from the top, dived at it a million miles an hour, and took a pretty long shot at it. Managed to managed to hit it sort of low, just above the tail, and I landed it. But um, I probably didn't deserve to land it. But um, you know, since then it's been been a lot of lot of mackerel hit the deck. But you know, that's the thing. You just you just got to try and try and stay calm and that's you know I've got mates that have been diving with me for probably 10 years and I'm like a broken record with them and I keep telling them 
you know what to do and and they it, you just you just can't control that that you know your heart rate going up and that that excitement which is yeah. which is great um you know I, I still get excited when i see a mackerel but you know i guess i'm a lot calmer now and i, I pretty much i just do it on instinct i don't do it on you know you go take a take a you know quick breath or basically if i'm not ready i'll just I just know that I've got a certain amount of time, and I guess yeah, a big thing is is interpretate, you know, interpreting each individual mackerel has got its own kind of mood depending on the day or depending on the school, and kind of summing up the situation even before you dive. Like you know, you'll you'll see them from the top, and you'll you'll know that some days you just know that you're going to get a shot in, and some days you just know that you know as soon as you leave the surface, they're just going to bolt. Okay. Um, so it's about you know, I guess for me, it's about summing up the behavior you know before you dive and then as, as you as you start to dive as well like some you know some mackerel you can you can just swim at them from the top and shoot them from 45 degrees i don't like shooting them from the top just because you you know you're aiming at a, at a smaller target um sometimes you can get you know you, you you're probably closer to them when you're directly above them but i'm just not that good a shot so um you know i like to get sort of at least 45 degrees or if not a bit more side on um but you know, that, so I, you know, I don't think there's a there's a set recipe. It's just yeah, it's just a matter of getting to know the fish's behaviour and, and I guess being relaxed enough that you can adapt to it. So if, if that means yeah, swimming away from them, like swimming away from them is great. You know, there's, there's no doubt that they'll that they'll respond to as will wahoo and you know dog tooth. If you ignore them and swim away from them, then they'll they'll generally fire them up. But cool. swimming away from them in, in mid water is is you know, if the water, if you're in 30, 30, 30 meter beers, then mackerel is going to be flighty. That's that's the reality of it. You know, they, they just they just don't feel comfortable coming within that that distance they need to be at. Um, and so that's when you need to, I guess, you know, get a bit more sneaky or do a bit more practice with the breath hold and try and convince them that that you're not that threatening. Um, but um, you know, yeah. So I guess for me, that's a that's a big thing. And I guess you know, having shot a few mackerel and over the years you kind of you kind of get to know exactly you know how the fish is going to react and you can almost interpret you know in you know whether you you know if you turn left it's going to be there and so you just slowly turn to the left and extend your gun out and it pretty much just swims out in front of your gun cool. and um and and take the shot um and you know the other thing is just not to not to panic and, and not to rush you know i've seen and i was guilty of it myself when i first started of taking long shots but now, every mackerel that, that you shoot and that you miss is one that you know doesn't end up in the boat and and I've seen it happen time and again you know you, you're diving with guys that aren't, aren't experienced the school of mackerel comes through a dive down they take a long shot wing one or miss one school school spooks you, you know and as, as it happens throughout the day they just get flighty and flighty and flighty in the end they just they just fuck off you just don't see them again yeah, yeah. Um, Whereas if you if you just stay calm and you don't take a shot, come up the top, you gradually you know after it might be half an hour, the next time you see the same school of fish, because mackerel will stay in the area, they might and you know, they might do big lap, big laps of the current, but you'll run run into them again, and then you then you then you get your shot, and you generally you know if you're not that kind of excited about it and it's not that big a deal, and I, I know it's I know it's hard to do, I've been there myself, but if you you know I, I say I. People that come on my boat, and I don't think I don't think Steve Steve was pretty good. I think he got three from three three from three today came out with us. But um, he, he, he never does that with us. He must have had some big influence there, Richard. Oh, we might have, we might have taken to some good spots too. But you know, I, I'm I'm pretty hard on people, and I say to them, look, don't don't take long shots if you're not close enough. Don't pull the trigger, and and that's that's how you got to be. Because as soon as you start to spook them or hit them. Um, and you know every mackerel that you hit and you lose is going to die, no question. Like, unless you, you know, unless you just pinprick it and your spear goes in a, a millimetre, but pretty much they build up that much lactic acid, you know, in a minute. That that's it. Even though they might look like they've swum off, and they're okay. They'll they'll die. So um, you know, it's just about about being responsible and, and setting set set goals for yourself. You know, instead of saying, well, I'm going to you know shoot every mackerel I see. So well, you know, you're better off to take one shot and get one fish. In the day, then take you know five shots and get nothing. Um, yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. And and you know it's sound a bit like a grumpy old bastard, but you know that's the reality of it. And and in the end, you'll come home with more fish and you and you, you'll be a better diver than if you you know. And there's not you know there's nothing more frustrating in yourself than than hitting a fish and losing it. You know everyone hates to do it. Yeah. 
Yeah. And with mackerel, often what happens is you, you you take a shot, you hit a fish, and as soon as you do that, the whole school is doing laps under your fins while you're frantically trying to reload your gun. Yeah. And as soon as your spear clicks in, that's they're it. You look down, and they're gone. And you know, if you if you hadn't taken that shot and you relaxed and you came back up to surf and you took a breath, nine times out of ten, they'll still be under your fins and you just dive down and shoot one. So. Yeah. Just, um, just for our audience, Richard, um, just so they've, they've got an idea, what, what, what is um, probably the biggest mackerel you've shot and um, was, that a, was that a stone shot? It was a stone shot. I've, I've oh. shot a couple. <laughs> I've, shot, I've shot, uh, I think I've shot four over 30. Wow. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, 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 it's only one of those was a stone shot. But yeah, the biggest one I shot was off, um, off, off 70 and 70 and uh, yeah, it was lying in the bottom at about 20 metres. And uh, we'd seen a, a heap of mackerel the day before, like, you know, thousands of mackerel, just more mackerel than you could poke a stick at. And this, yeah, this morning they just, they were just, they just weren't there. There was just, hadn't seen any after about an hour and it was just lying on the bottom and, yeah, looked up and as soon as you see a big mackerel, you can just, they're just, their heads just look, you know, out of proportion and you can, you can almost see their teeth from, you know, 15 metres away, big, big head on it. And that's, you know, that's generally how you can tell a bigger mackerel is underwater just by the size of its head and the size of its eye. And, yeah, so sort I of didn't didn't want to pull in. It was sort of just just a bit weary, and yeah, just just kept looking away from it, and um, just kept my head down. And eventually, I could see it sort of start to turn. And you know, often with mackerel, once you you can sort of see it in their eye, they'll they'll do one little turn, and you just know they're just going to keep coming. Um, as long as as long as you don't you know as long as you don't swim at them or, or make any sudden movements, often they'll just make one turn. And if you if you just ignore them, they'll just keep coming, 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 and they'll just swim right up to you. And that's what this guy did. He, yeah, he sort of started up a little bit above me, and then just sort of just dived down to my level, and yeah, just, just sort of hit him behind the head through the spine, and she was all over. But um, I think that was yeah, that was thirty four. So wow. Um, yeah, that was a good fish. But um, when you when you see like something like for me, the, the biggest mackerel I've shot's fourteen kilo. Turbo shot some monsters as well. I don't think anything over thirty. But um, one thing I've noticed is, is that when fish get sort of like over that 20 kg mark and you don't stone them and you have to subdue them there's kind of some real there's there's a few dangerous moments there if you don't handle yourself correctly what what's some of the things you do to handle a big fish like that you know i guess if, if I, I shot one off off more than i don't know maybe maybe a couple of months ago and same thing it, you know pretty much swam right up to me and I, I got a really good shot into it but i could see my spear go through probably three quarters of the way through the fish but for some reason my flopper didn't open up and um, and I could see when I you know once once I got the fish in it took a massive run but the flop you know my, my spear wasn't wasn't all the way through it so the flop had opened up inside the body so I, yeah I, I just you know I just called for the boat and got a second gun and, and you know shot it in the head and that's that's often not a not a bad way to if you if you aren't you know if you if you've got a really good shot into a even a you know, forty kilo mackerel you can you can pretty much as long as you're holding on to the spear and the spears. Even with the spears in the head, you know you're not going to get bitten. So you, you just got to get used to, yeah, grabbing the tail with the, you know, whatever is your strongest hand, whether it's your lefty or right. Grab the tail really, you know, really strong with that hand, and then just get your get your hands in the gills, um, you know, as, as quick as you can. Mackerel are pretty good. They're not, you know, they they're not like things like, you know, big jacks or big trout that kind of clench their gills sharp. Their gills are pretty much always open. So get your hand in there, but. You know, not too far because I've seen plenty of people get get bitten by a mackerel. Um, yeah. And and uh, and I and then you know then just brain them and bleed them. You know, we're we're doing the sport because we cause we want to eat the fish that we catch as yep. much as you know we do it because we love it. But I've seen so many people shoot you know mackerel and, and not bleed them. And it, if you don't bleed your mackerel, you might as well just throw them away. You know, you just That's an you awesome bitch. You've got to bleed them straight away. Sort of bleed them in the water. I've never had, a, ever had a shark. You know, if a shark's going to eat your fish, it'll eat your fish while it's running. It's, it's not going to come and eat the fish out of your hand. So yeah. people shouldn't be you know, too afraid of, you know, if you obviously if there's sharks around, you want to pull it pull it out and hang its head in the water and bleed it then. But but braining them and, 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 and bleeding them straight away is, you know, really important. When, when, when you're braining them, mate, where are you, how are you finding the brain for someone who's never done it before? Uh, is there a clue on the top of the head or somewhere where they should stick the knife? Yeah, there's generally like a little, almost like a little kind of a flat, little flat spot sort of just behind the eye, um, sort of on the back of the head. And if you look at it closely enough, you can almost kind of, it's not, it's not really an indent, but you can sort of see a change in the, in the muscle structure. Um, yep. But, cool. you know, I guess, yeah, um, it's probably, yeah, without a, 
without a, a mackerel in front of me, it's a bit hard to explain, I suppose. Um, yeah, and that's but, one of those. But, you things. know, you, you 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 kind of you know you, you don't want to be you don't want to be you know just above the eye. You want to be a little bit behind the eye, and then you know just just go in and as, as soon as you know as soon as hit the brain, you know you know you've got it. Um, cool. I think you know. I think just just putting yourself in the you know in the in the right place at the right time. Um, you know, if you if you're going out to shoot mackerel off Brisbane in, in winter, then you you know you're probably you're probably not going to do it. Um, and you know, it depends, it depends where you are, I suppose. But um, and and just you know just just do the time. Um, if you if you if you're mad about shooting mackerel, there's you know there's enough spots along. Well, whether you're in Queensland or South Africa or wherever you are, there's there's enough spots that hold good mackerel. You know, that aren't that aren't secret spots. You know, people people there's plenty of spots off Stratty and Morton, um, the Sunny Coast, the Gold Coast that you know that hold mackerel that, that everyone knows hold mackerel. It's just a matter of kind of learning the conditions and you know learning that there's certain days that you know you just just not going to see a mackerel because the water's the water's cold or it's green, and there's other days where you know they're going to be there. It's just a matter of you know a matter of finding them. Um, Man, that was an awesome veterans vault. Yeah. Wow, that was that was cool. There's heaps of takeaways from that. Thanks, Richard. Um, what's the, what's the funniest thing you've seen out spearfishing? Um, we've had some gold ones of this on the on the show, yeah. so that's a hard one. Man. Hey, all the blokes I know are pretty pretty serious, grumpy old bastard. So are they? They don't do too many funny things. Um, probably the most funny. Well, I mean, it was funny at the time. Was um was it was a guy. Of, yeah, diving with a mate of mine, a Fraser, and um, there was, look, there was, yeah, there was that many mackerel around, it was just crazy, and so I filmed him shooting a mackerel, I was just lying behind him, and, and uh, while he shot one, but yeah, it took him about, it was only a 10 kilo fish, it just took him about probably five minutes to grab it by the tail, and it just kept sort of jumping over his head as I was filming it, and, and I don't, you know, I don't, I had a GoPro, but, um, you know, I just, I guess that's the other thing, I suppose, is, um, you know, if you want to learn how to shoot fish and become a good diver, then you, you kind of got to do it, I suppose, for the right reasons. Um, and uh, you know, taking taking footage of every fish you shoot and every fish that someone else is shoot, shooting is. I'm not saying it's not for the right reasons, but it's probably uh, you know, it's probably not. It's probably not conducive to, I guess, learning how to how to how to be a be a good diver. And you know, you kind of diving is a selfish sport. You know, it's 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 a very kind of individual sport that you can you know enjoy with your mates, but. But it's also a very selfish sport, and if you want to get good at, you know, at good at it, then you you kind of have to prioritise, you know, doing it doing it for yourself. And I think if you if you're doing it just to make, you know, videos or or put yourself on YouTube, then um, you know, maybe you're not doing it for the right reason. But that's not very funny. So um, <laughs> no, no, that's that's that's, 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 that's consistent. You wanted it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, uh, I'm the that's the main thing. I, I think you're right in a lot of ways, Richard. Um, Darren Shields, when we interviewed him, he's a Kiwi Spiro. He said, um, "Don't go around dressed like a Christmas tree." And I think, like, I think it's part of the same sort of thing. You you can get distracted by trying to do too many things at once. And like, if you if you're going to be a hunter, it's kind of like you got to focus and be a hunter. And uh, I, li- I like that. And uh, and guys that like filming, it's kind of it's it's, its own separate thing. And um, when you mix the two, sometimes you don't do either well. So, uh, uh, right, and I think you know an- another another way to, to get you know to get good at shooting mackerel is on the days when the mackerel are thick, um, and you know the, there's days when you can when you can bag out if you want in ten minutes mm-hmm. is to, to just to jump in. If you want to film them, great. Just jump in without a gun, or if you want to carry a gun, carry an unloaded gun or whatever, and just spend time in the water with them, and just just basically. The more time you spend in the water with them, the better you get at interpreting that their behaviour, and and the more relaxed you get with them, and the more relaxed you are with, with any fish, but particularly mackerel, if you're mid water, the more you're going to shoot. You know, it's it's that simple. If, if you can relax and act disinterested, then you're going to shoot mackerel. Um, you know, every every day that you go out there and you see them. Richard, the um the second mackerel I ever shot was probably over 30 kg, and I never landed it. And uh, I shot it on a reel gun. It was a little, really cheap plastic little reel um, that I got as part of some deal when I first started. And I was super stoked. And I went out just short diving. And I uh, and I dived down, and this massive mackerel came to me. And I didn't actually realise how big it was. And I shot it. And I put the spear through it, and it didn't even react. And and I was like, well, what happens now? So staying on the bottom, I gave it a bit of a pull. 
And this thing just screamed out and stupidly had hold of the reel line and it just cut through the glove and cut, cut my fingers and I got to the surface and I remember my mate saying, when you hit the surface, you, you sort of lock the reel off and, and you go, with it. well, I locked the reel off and this thing just proceeded just to pull me through the chop and I'm just going through the chop going boom, 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 like this, you know, and I could not <laughs> believe the power of it. And to be honest, I actually, I, I shat myself. I couldn't believe how strong it was because, mind you, I'd been shooting uh, flathead the week before and then I just stepped up to like a 30 kg mackerel and I just could not <laughs> believe the power of the thing. It eventually tore off, so I, I killed that fish and I, I didn't get it in. But um, what, what can you say about when you're playing a fish, how hard or soft should you play them? Because they're, they're actually a rather soft fish, aren't they? Yeah, look, they're, you know, they're certainly not as soft as a, as a wahoo. Like, if, you know, if, if you punch a spear through a, you know, through a mackerel under 20 kilos and, and it's a, you know, a mid-body shot and you see a flopper open up on the other side, you know, you're not going to be able to skull drag them up without any line, but you can certainly put a heat of pressure on them and they're not going to tear out, whereas Wahoo will pretty much, you know, I've seen them just about peel themselves in half, um, even if you shoot them, you know, side on instead of from a little bit from behind. But, um, you know, I, I, I use a real gun and a belt reel. Um, I, think using a, I think using a real gun without a belt reel is, is, you know, is, is dangerous in that you just, the temptation, if you do get into trouble to not let your gun go is, is just too big. Um, whereas at least if you were if you're wearing a belt reel, and you're always clipped off to your belt reel, so it's not a matter of swimming around with a you know with a with an untethered gun. You basically you've got your, your reel on your gun, and if that jams, you can you can play it on your belt reel just to, enough to get up get up to the top. Um, but you know generally even even big mackerel won't you know won't run they won't run as hard as wahoo. So they might you know, they'll certainly take all 50 meters of line if you if you gun reel, and then maybe. You know, 30 or 40, but I've never been spooled by, or, or been, you know, I've certainly been towed through the water by Big Mackerel, but I've never had both my belt reel and my, and my gun reel emptied by them. Um, and they'll sort of, you know, Mackerel will kind of, you know, they might do one big run and then maybe another couple of smaller ones, but, you know, it's never a long, sustained run. Um, it just depends on the shot, you know, if you put a, you can put a bad shot into a 10 kilo fish and it'll take out 80 metres of line because you know you just can't put any pressure on it. Um, and I guess that's the difference between a rig line and a and a and a and a, and a, and a, and a, um, a real gun is that the drag on the rig line is so much greater than it is on you know team of Dyneema that you can put a bad shot in with the with a real gun and still land your fish. Whereas yeah, right. you put a bad shot in with a with a rig line, just the drag from the from the float and the ropes enough to enough to lose them. Um, but you know in terms of yeah in terms of in terms of how much pressure you can put on, it really just depends on the shot. Um, I'll often try and shoot mackerel under under the spine because they, they're just a little bit if you hit them under the you know in the gut area under the spine there's a little bit you just haven't got as much kind of meaty stuff to punch through um you know, a lot of a lot of guys when they first start out or you know you're, you're, you're sort of taking shots that you know maybe not necessarily long shots but you hit the spine and you you know you see the fish go blood and your spear doesn't punch through because you hit the spine and then it just falls out and the mackerel swims off and himself and, and die so I guess I kind of got into the habit of yeah, shooting them under the spine always you know from a little bit from behind and that way you're, you're punching through the guts just much softer um, particularly if, you know if you know it's a long shot but I'm not advocating anybody takes long shots um, particularly not my mate long shot Ed but um <laughs> Shout out um, to long shot Ed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'll, he'll, he'll love that. Oh, um, we love naming and shaming yeah. our mates too. So good stuff, Richard. But um, but yeah, you know, if you if you put a good shot into a mackerel, you can you know you can you can hang on kind of as hard as you you know. Any time you're getting dragged through the water and you, know, you feel like something's going to break, that's that's always too too long. But you know, I, I don't I don't see any you know. Part of the thrill of diving is you know. Watching your reel getting emptied by a mackerel doesn't matter how big. <laughs> it is. So, yeah, unless there's unless it's super sharky, there's really no need to, you know, go super crazy about about pulling them in too quick. Yeah, um, cool. Just just enjoy it. I wanted to ask you another question because Turbo's question was great. I love that one about playing a big fish. Um, now, Steve, I know you've got a good answer to this. Steve's told me one of the systems you work because real, real, real gun divers have got a little bit of a reputation that they're a little bit dangerous. Now you've you've said one thing that you do to counteract that is by wearing a belt reel staying attached to it the whole time that way you can let your gun go you, you can still go to the surface you're okay now the other, the other thing I was going to ask you is is um, what system do you use um, with with floats and stuff to stay safe using real guns yeah I mean I guess that, you know that I guess floats are the, the, the big thing in terms of safety I guess my my take on it is 
you know, there's that many fishermen out there that don't know what a dive flag looks like, let alone what a, yeah. what a Spiro float looks like. And, you know, the amount of times that I've nearly been run over with a float or, well, mainly with a float, um, I think a float in some ways gives you, you know, a false sense of security in that you can you, you anchor the boat or you're drifting with a boat and you, the boat might be two or three hundred metres away from you because he can see your float. But, you know, fishermen coming along trolling at, at 10 knots or 12 knots for Wahoo or maybe slow for mackerel, he's not looking, you know, he's not looking out for floats, he's just going about his business. Um, and because you've got a float, you know, you're not really paying attention to boats um, and so you just kind of become a bit... I guess blase about it. Whereas I find when you're diving with a real gun, you pretty much know that you're invisible. As soon as you hear a boat on the bottom, um, and you can hear them from a long way away, come up to the top, take a look, see where it is, and you know make sure that you take I guess some responsibility about making sure that you can see them because you know they 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 can't see you most of the time, even if you've got a float or not. Um, and a lot of the diving that we do is in a you know is in a small boat, so it's my boat. Is only four and a half metres long, and so we'll often we'll, we'll just drift with it. We'll put a sea anchor on, and we'll drift with the boat. Someone might be tethered off of the boat, but generally you're within you know 30 metres of the boat anyway, because you're drifting at the same speed as the boat. So cool. You know, that for me, I guess that's how that's how I deal with it. Yep. Um, by, by staying close to the boat, um, and you know I think that yeah, floats are you know, floats are great, and having a, a big visible flag on your float is fantastic. But you still have to take responsibility and, and basically be aware that you know fishermen. I'm not looking out for divers as much as we, you know, much as we'd like them to. Yep. Um, you see a boat, you've got to come up and you've got to make sure that you see it and try and evade it. You know, if, if it's if there's going to be something wrong, and you know, having a good boat is obviously critical as well. Yep. You know, as soon as you see a boat, obviously try and get between the boat and the divers. But if you're diving with, you know, five or six people and they spread out over a big area, then yeah, 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 that that can be tricky. So. Um, you know, that's I guess that's the that's the other thing is that you know generally I'm only diving with one or two other guys, so you know you can sort of afford to to stay close together. And you know, the other, I guess the other thing with you know with, with you put enough space. But if you've got six people in the water or four people in the water and you're all on top of each other, um, you know, if you're diving for for mackerel and you're diving shallow, I mean obviously you want you want to keep an eye on each other. But if you've got six six people or four people, you know, diving up and down and one person's down at you know 15 meters and the other person's 20 meters away, 10 meters. Mackerel just don't like that. They get really flighty. So if you want to shoot mackerel and there's a group of you, just go one up, one down. Doesn't matter how many of them you are. Either that or between each other that you, know, you, you can't see each other. But obviously that's not safe. So, um, but having having people even even having people above you in clear water when there's mackerel around you will will split you. Um, okay. So cool. I guess yeah, it's just. Um, just be aware of those things, I guess. You're, you're dropping some real value bombs here, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Loving it. There's heaps of good information here for our audience, so thanks for that. Now, we've, we've taken up a lot of your time, but um, Fast Five Facts is the next um, section of the show. Pedro looks after that for us. Where are you, Pedro? See? It's time for Noob Spiro's Fast Five Facts. So, Fast Five Facts is, um, if you were starting out spearfishing all over again, what five short pieces of advice would have helped you out the most? I guess, yeah, I mean, you know, firstly, get the right gear, which if we come to later, I won't say too much more about that. Yep, yep. Um, you know, and that, you know, that's that's getting the right, you know, the right wetsuit, the right fins, the right, you know, rig line, float, reel gun, whatever you want. Um, but, you know, you need, you need, you need good gear, you need, you know, for more more of a safety perspective than, than anything else, probably you know probably a good set of fins is is the best investment that that a diver can make. Um, cool. Whether they carbon fins or plastic composite fins or but you know what brand? No doubt. What brands do you like for fins? Just quickly. Look, I've, I've been using dive bars for probably the last ten years and and I love them. But you know I've got mates that, that love their penetrator fins and yep. so you know there's a bunch of fins on the market. But you know it's a matter of finding the the fin that. That, that suits your swimming style the best. Um, yep. You know, for me, it's the medium dive bars. I just love them. Cool. Um, but you know, that's probably the best bit of gear that you know that that, that a diver's got really. Um, yep. All right. Uh, so number one was right gear. Number two. <laughs> I guess yeah. Get a you know find a group of guys that a you enjoy diving with. 
um, and and B that you can that you can learn off. So um, you know if you if that means trying to trying to get trying to hook up with with older, more experienced, cranky people like me, um, <laughs> then um, you know that that's good. But yeah, for me, I was lucky in that you know I started diving with, with guys that had you know 20 years experience and were kind enough to, to take me out and, and show me the ropes. All right, number three. I think probably you know with, without without being unsafe is to is to you know. I guess push yourself and, and, and put yourself out of your comfort zone. Um, so again, I started, you know, I started diving with guys that were diving, you know, 10 or 15 meters deeper than I could dream of diving. But I was happy to go out with them and just drift in that, you know, deep water, knowing that I couldn't get to the bottom. But you know, just just relax and just 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 get comfortable being in the water, basically. Mm. Um, you know, that takes a long time to, you know, you you, you might you might get seasick or you you, you know comfortable on the boat so just yeah just spending as much time as you possibly can in the water on other people's boats in different conditions yep. um, and just just being comfortable and, and knowing that you know no matter where you go whether it's you know whether it's Vanuatu or Timor or Ningaloo or whatever you're going to be comfortable in the water and you're not going to be, be freaking out because if you're if you're not comfortable and you're, and you're not feeling 100% then you, you know you just can't dive properly. That's great. That's a different one too. We haven't had that before. Get uncomfortable to get comfortable. Really, is sort of what you're saying. So, but safe, but safely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no, we we got it. We got the message. That was good. All right. So three good ones there. Number four. Number four. Um. Just looking after your wife. So she lets you go diving. We've got a pretty. Oh, oh that's a good one. Oh, what a greaser! Happy. What a greaser! We'll send you. I've got a very understanding wife who, who pretty much lets me go diving whenever I want. Good, good stuff, Mrs. Pillins. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, she's, she's unlikely to ever listen to this, so that's pretty much wasted. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was something that I thought about just then. I guess yeah, you know, learn to learn to learn to interpret the weather, um, and kind of you know make up your own mind about forecasts are generally pretty good these days. But you know, use a variety of of tools and, and resources available on the net to to um you know to, to find out what the conditions are like. I guess you know these days there's social media is that bigger you know bigger thing that it's easy to well I'm not on Facebook so I wouldn't know but apparently you know it's easy to, to to follow everyone that follows everyone else and find out who shot what today and you know what the water's like. But but often that's you know often you go out the day after and there's you know there's a uh, fish tree or the or the water's gone green so. Mm. You kind of got to learn to, yeah, to, to figure out, you know, by your, by yourself, obviously, you know, obviously within reason, with, you know, whether or not you can dive or not. But um, certainly nothing wrong with taking a seat to go diving if the conditions. Are, uh, <laughs> I love it. You're talking. That, you're talking tracks language. <laughs> that's that. You know, that's that kind of selfish, selfish diver attitude that yeah. uh, that, you, that you kind of need. Um, cool. All right. So we'll read those back to you. So. Your first point was um, get the right gear, the suit, the fins, the the whole lot, so that uh, you're more effective in the water. Number two, get a crew that you get along with or one that can impart some knowledge to you to improve your diving. Number three, push yourself but stay safe and uh, get uncomfortable to get comfortable. Uh, number four, uh, keep the missus happy. If you keep her happy, you're going to get in the water more often. Number five, learn to interpret the weather. Um, use the tools that, that are at hand today to uh, check the conditions and see what it's about. There's a and good there's a good post coming up on yeah. Noob Spiro about that too. And, oh really? Yeah, 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 it's one in the works. And, uh, and number number six, take a sicky if you have to. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I love it. All right, um, the the last sort of bit we have on the show, Richard, is crucial kit for noobs. You alluded you wanted to talk passionately about guns, I believe. Yeah, look, I'm not. You know, I guess before I say that, I, I should note that I'm that I have never been or I'm not sponsored by, <laughs> by anybody and nor am I trying to get sponsored by everyone but um disclaimer I love it you know in, you know <laughs> in, in my books and I've seen a lot of mates go from you know from from Rob balance to the different brands that have come out over the years but they always everyone, come back every one of them goes back and uh, every time they do that I just go you know what were you thinking like how could you how could you fall <laughs> in love with, with your Rob Allen it's it's a it's a crime um and you know, shooting mackerel isn't about isn't about using big, powerful guns. You know, you you, you need in my in my book, you, you need a 1.2 or 1.3 single rubber gun to shoot. You know, pretty much 
every single fish that you know you'll ever want to shoot um you might need a big cannon if you want to shoot big tuna and you've got to punch through you know a meter of flesh but for shooting mackerel and wahoo using those big guns is really a disadvantage because you, you know they're unwieldy they're not necessarily as accurate um as, as the smaller guns and um you know they're just they're just harder to, to work in the water so you end up you know reducing the amount of time you can spend down there because you're lugging a big hunk of wood or or two rubbers and you know you don't underestimate the amount of drag even from one rubber to two rubber um you know that'll that'll, that'll have a so are you running uh, like a single 20 mil or a single 16 on your one two one threes so you know all i use these days and pretty much all I've ever used is is a is a 1.3 carbon Rob Allen. I, you know, I, I used to used to have the aluminium ones. I still do, but you know the carbon the carbon guns are certainly much lighter and a lot more maneuverable than the than the aluminium ones. Um, and um, that's yeah. So a single 20 mil rubber with a with a 1.8 meter shaft. So I generally go yeah probably 10 centimeters centimeters longer than what they what they manufacture them with. Um, there's a guy. One of the one of the great South African spearers, a guy called Jula Fulgani, who um who, who yeah immigrated to uh, Australia a couple of years ago, and um you know he was saying that basically they found that, that that's the best kind of combination of, of having those 1.8 meter shafts and the 1.3 guns just to got a little bit more punching power. That that extra 10 centimeters of you know shaft just just adds a little bit more punch. Um, but um you know some people prefer a shorter shorter overhang and yeah but you know that's just that's just me i suppose so i guess you know whatever whatever you're comfortable with but um but it, yeah in my opinion rob allen rob allen gear is just you know it's just so reliable it doesn't i've never had a trig mech fail i've never had anything go wrong with them really um, yeah, we call it the toyota of the of the spear gun world yeah yep. always reliable. that's right yeah um, no, we, we just interviewed Rob Allen, so this will follow up well from his, his uh, show. So we'll we'll be sure to hand your details on to him for sponsorship. Richard. <laughs> 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 no, I think he, yeah, he, in all seriousness, I think he designed his spear guns with macro and similar species in mind. So no, it's, mm. it's pretty cool. You, the feedback you've given him, he'll, yeah, yeah. he'll love to hear that, I'm sure. All good, Richard. I've had a, I've had a great time um, chatting to you today. Yeah, We've got great. some some awesome stuff turbo you've had fun yeah mate, i've had a good night we've we've learned a few things there tonight that rob didn't come up with so that's excellent yeah no thanks for coming on the show richard and um if you had one more thing to say to our audience what would it be radio silence <laughs> <laughs> um oh, hey put me on the spot again yeah um, i love it i love no, doing so- this stay safe and have fun you know um certainly for me diving you know it's an escape from from everyday life and reality and you know you you kind of you're at peace with the world and if that's what you love doing you know do it do it as often as you can and, and just enjoy it and make the most of it while you're out there and um you know yeah just have fun awesome that's yeah. epic that captures it well thanks richard oh, we'll yeah. um hit stay on the line mate we'll, we'll keep chatting to you but thanks for coming no worries guys my pleasure thanks Thanks for listening today, Noob Spiro. If you'd like to find out any more information from today's guest, then head over to noobspiro.com. We really appreciate you guys as listeners. Without you, we couldn't do the show. So if you want to help us out, leave us a review on iTunes or head on over to noobspiro.com and uh, sign up for our newsletter. We won't send you crap. So that's all from us. A big hooroo. We hope to see you soon. Shrek over and out. <laughs> <laughs>